We need to get a picture of you with all that equipment. <laughs> you got to do that and post it. It's pretty impressive. Can't wait to clean it all up so it looks a little less complicated. It's probably just going to get more complicated, I guess. Okay, so uh, yesterday we were we were talking about ended up talking about adiabatic changes. So you can imagine a piston in a cylinder where it's thermally insulated from the outside. So when you press on that, that piston, the heat can't leak out, the temperature is going to go up. And mathematically, that's governed by this well-known relationship, the pressure times the volume to the gamma pow to the power of gamma is a constant. And gamma is the ratio of specific heats, as we discussed. So we can evaluate this constant of equilibrium. And we get this quantitative relationship here. So we're going to need this for acoustics, but um, we're going to be able to simplify this because we're only interested in linear acoustics. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But first we need to talk about why is sound adiabatic? <coughs> sound involves compressions and expansions of a fluid. And it's not isothermal, almost always it's not isothermal. And it's, this is not obvious, and in fact, Newton got it wrong. It was one of the few times, you know, he got a few things wrong. Uh, you know, being able to turn lead into gold by chemical processes, he, he got that wrong. Can't do that. Um, and he also got this wrong. Um, he thought the sound was isothermal. <coughs> and he actually did some theory of acoustics and came up with a speed of sound. We'll talk about speed of sound, of course, later. Um, next day or two, he was off by 15% because he thought it was isothermal. This will be a homework, we'll do this in a homework problem, okay? Um, but anyway, and that was certainly, that can be measured at that time. They could have measured this. I don't know if anybody did. So anyway, why is it adiabatic? Uh, a number of people think that sound is adiabatic because it's so fast. The compressions and expansions are so fast there's not time for the heat. When there's a compression, there's not time for the heat to leak out to where the expansions are, where it's colder, okay? That's only, in some sense, half of the picture. It's not just the, the time that's important here. It's the distance that the heat has to travel. When you go to a higher frequency sound wave, the wavelength is shorter. Most of you probably know this, but we'll, we'll derive it later. It's a simple fact. Higher frequency waves have shorter wavelengths. So when you go to higher frequency, it is, it is true that at higher frequency, it's harder for the sound to leak out because it's happening so quickly. But it has a shorter distance to travel, doesn't it? So here I have a compression, and here I have two expansions. At higher frequency, they're closer together. So there are competing effects there. It's not obvious which one wins out. And the only way that I know how to do this is to look at the um, diffusion equation that describes how heat flows. And then you have to analyze that and plug in typical values for acoustics, and you find that acoustics is almost always adiabatic. So this is a little bit beyond the course. We're not going to do that. But I think it is important. And I don't know if KFCS actually mentioned this. They must say something about it. I can't remember. <coughs> now, there are some interesting cases where sound is isothermal. And um, one of them here is if you have sound propagating in a, a metal tube, and the diameter is sufficiently small, then when you have a compression and the fluid tends to heat up, air or whatever you have, what's going to happen? You know, this, it begins to get hotter and there's this metal there. The metal will conduct the heat. So you can essentially short out approximately the, the temperature fluctuations and the sound will be approximately adiabatic. You can also have sound propagating through a uh, fine grade steel wool. It, will, it can short out there. That can be approximately isothermal. But I need to warn you about something. It's not, well, it's not necessarily just a warning. It can be very useful. Um, in both of these cases, the metal tube has to be quite small. You've got to have a lot of steel wool, <coughs> uh, fine steel wool. <coughs> Excuse me. And in both of those cases, <coughs> sorry, in both of those cases, the sound 
will attenuate significantly. And in fact, uh, now that I'm th thinking about it, uh, a lot of times people will do controlled experiments of acoustics in a pipe. And we've done that here. We had an apparatus that was down on a basement wall down there, a long acoustic propagation tube. We were looking at a nonlinear experiment. Um, we didn't want reflections. So how did we stop, how did we prevent reflections from sound? We were driving this tube, it's a big aluminum tube in sections, it was 20 meters long. <clears throat> how did we not get reflections? Well, we, uh, this problem's been around for a long time and there are articles on it. The last section of the tube, we put uh, very fine grade steel wool in there. And we tapered it such that it was just a little bit of steel wool in the beginning and then it got more and more dense. And it was an excellent absorber of sound. I'm getting a little carried away here. Okay, so anyway, there's another interesting case that some of you may know about. <coughs> and that is, um, water has this peculiar property <coughs> that if you look at the, uh, I'm gonna do this in Celsius degrees here. Something happens at four degrees Celsius. What is it? The density of water is a maximum. The density of water is a maximum. How many people are, are aware of that? Oh, yeah, so it's, this is, um, <coughs> this is interesting. I guess it pertains to global warming too, rise, um, rise of sea level. So anyway, it's a maximum here. So if, I <coughs> if I'm over here and I add a little bit of heat to water, what's going to happen? We move this way, the density goes down, so it expands. <coughs> Not surprising, right? Most substances expand when you add heat. What if we're over here and we add heat? The density goes up, it compresses. The density goes up, it doesn't expand. It compresses. So if you're right around four degrees <coughs> and you add or take away a little bit of heat here, the density is constant. And in that case, amazingly, I'm having trouble here. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. These two situations become the same. Right? I add a little bit of heat here. This is at four degrees Celsius. We don't, we don't lose any energy into lifting the weight in the gravitational field. The sound becomes adiabatic, simultaneously adiabatic and isothermal at four degrees Celsius. Kind of interesting. So gamma, what's gamma equal to? One, yeah, gamma is equal to one in that case. Um, uh, moving on here, I actually mentioned this yesterday, the ideal gas law is, um, Almost always a good approximation. You've got to be away from a phase transition, though. You know, you've got this gas, and it's, if it's sufficiently cool and you're getting near it condensing into a liquid, the, the ideal gas law will break down. So, but what if we want to deal with something that's not an ideal gas? You know where we're headed in this course, right, regarding mediums, air and water. That's really what we're going to be mostly interested in for obvious reasons. So how do we deal with water? It's not an ideal gas or something else. Well, we can approach the problem in general here, okay? What we need from the thermodynamics here is how, is a relationship between the pressure and the density in the acoustic wave. That's what we need. We need to link those two, okay? Here's the link for an ideal gas. For an arbitrary fluid, we can do, we can develop a Taylor expansion here. So we're thinking of the pressure as a function of density and you'll recognize this, all of you should recognize this as a Taylor expansion. I mean, it's a little kind of dressed up, you know, just call this X if you want, <laughs> right? And this is a fun, in fact, I think oh, some, elsewhere in the notes, I'll, I'll write, actually write down a standard Taylor expansion. I guess it's later. Um, so here we are thinking the pressure as a function of density. And this is a well-known Taylor expansion, right? Everyone recognizes this. Now these derivatives here are evaluated in equilibrium. This is an expansion about equilibrium. And these derivatives have to be taken adiabatically because sound is adiabatic, right? So, now here's the first time where we hear 
quantitatively what we mean by linear acoustics. Linear acoustics means that the sound itself is a slight perturbation. You know, the change in density is very small, change in pressure is very small. If this is very small, the square of a small quantity is going to be extremely small. So we neglect all these higher order terms. So for linear acoustics, we just truncate it right there. It's linear. The pressure here is linear. We collect quadratic and cubic terms. So when we do that, we get this relationship for the pressure. And now we want to identify the quantities here. This is the change in density due to the acoustic wave. We call it the, uh, call it, I don't have it written down here, but you can call this the acoustic density. Okay, bring this pressure over here. This is the change in pressure due to the acoustic wave. We call this the acoustic pressure. All right, and KFCS deal, which is not the way I learned it, but this is what, uh, this is what, how they do it, and we're going to follow what they do, and it is, it has its uses. Instead of dealing with just the change in density, we're going to normalize that to the background density. So this is the fractional change in density, the change in density divided by the density. And that's called the condensation. It's a dimensionless quantity, as you can see. Um, okay. So our equation, we can write our equation in terms of these quantities right here. We can express this like this. For any fluid, the acoustic pressure is proportional to the condensation. This constant of proportionality will depend upon the fluid. It'll vary from one fluid to the next. And even if you're just in one fluid, if you change the temperature or change the pressure, this in general will change. Okay? This is called, it's called, in thermodynamics, this is called the bulk modulus. Some of you might have heard that before if you've had some thermodynamics. The reciprocal of the bulk modulus. The bulk modulus here is how the pressure changes with density. If you take the reciprocal of that, how the density changes with pressure, that's a more physical quantity. It's called the compressibility. So these are standard thermodynamic quantities. Um, this is analogous to Hooke's law, incidentally. You know, Hooke's law for a spring, for the magnitudes, spring exerts a force that's proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. We see a similar thing here. <coughs> what plays the role of the displacement is the, the, the um, condensation here. Here's playing the role of the force, and, and this is playing the role of the spring constant. And I want to remind you, it's only true for, you know, you have to have sufficiently small pressure swings and condensation swings or variations here. We've made, we've linearized. This is only true for small, small changes here. Remember, we, we linearized it. Okay. So, we can, this is what we're going to use. This is what we need. Okay, we can work with this for, we can use this for any fluid. This um, bulk modulus here is typically measured experimentally. So you just look it up. And this will be what we need to do acoustics. Incidentally, I don't have this in the notes, but um, this is a thermodynamic quantity. And you may wonder, how do people accurately measure these quantities? You know, you, you sort of, maybe you see people using styrofoam to insulate things. Every, you see some kind of quasi-static experiment. It turns out that often what people do is they do this acoustically. Acoustics can be a, a really fine probe. So often these quantities that we need for acoustics are, are measured actually acoustically. Um, okay, any questions so far? Now, one thing we should do here, this is entirely general for any fluid. We know we have a special case of an ideal gas. We should be able, we know the relationship between the pressure and the density change or the condensation for an ideal gas. So we can actually determine the bulk modulus of an ideal gas here. So here's our, here's how the pressure varies with density. When, when under, for adiabatic transformations, which is what, which is what is relevant for acoustics. 
The bulk modules, here's our definition of the bulk modules, how the pressure changes with density, fractional density. So we can actually just substitute this in here, take the derivative. Uh, we'll do something, I'm not going to go through this in detail, we're going to do something similar in the problem set Thursday. So you just carefully do this, do just what the math tells you to do here, and you end up, you can simplify, and you end up with this expression for the bulk modulus of, of a gas, of an ideal gas. It's the ratio of specific heats times the equilibrium pressure. So if I've got an ideal gas and I increase the equilibrium pressure, the, it's stiffer. It's stiffer, right? Because we've increased the, the, the pressure here. This has acoustic consequences, as we will see. The sound will travel faster. Um, <coughs> now, I've already talked about this. Now, a little bit of a warning here. This is really unfortunate. In fact, I still remember the first time I hit this. I could not believe it. Some people, and it's in KFCS, you can look. And by people here, I have to tell you, I mean underwater acousticians primarily, OK? What they, what they sometimes do is, they pretend that the substance is an ideal gas, like seawater, okay? And they determine, you know, there's a bulk, gonna be a bulk modulus, there's, and there's gonna be other, uh, other properties. They determine effective values of gamma and P naught, okay? So, um, it sounds confusing, doesn't it? But, by putting in some empirical information, you can find effective values here. So in other words, you can think of the seawater, whatever you're dealing with, as an ideal gas when, if you use these parameters. These are far from the actual pressure in the water, this is far, and, and the gamma, these are, these are just fit, they are literally fit parameters, okay? So I think this is a really dangerous thing to do, but underwater, some underwater acousticians like to do this, okay? And it's, this is discussed, I think, briefly in the book. You can look if you're interested. We're gonna stay away from it. I immediately decided that the first time I ever hit this. But, you know, underwater acousticians must use it because it's useful, but you really need to be careful. And I think the first time through acoustics, this is really dangerous. You can start to think that these are physical quantities. They're not, they're fit parameters, unless you have an ideal gas. For an ideal gas, this is the ratio of specific heats, and this is the equilibrium pressure, but only for an ideal gas. Okay. So we now have enough thermo. The next thing is conservation of mass, and this goes under the name of equation of continuity, as we'll, we'll derive right now. So here's the basic idea. <coughs> We need to make sure we, we conserve mass. We're dealing with non-relativistic flows here. Speeds are much less than the speed of light. So we don't have to worry about relativistic corrections. Um, so mass is going to be conserved. So here's a, a simple idea. If you've got, you've got this fluid here, and if the flow, here's some mathematical boundary that we imagine in our heads. If the flow is outward everywhere, the mass has to be decreasing. In, in time. This mass inside there has to be going down because mass is conserved. In fact, the rate, the total rate of mass leaving this sphere here has to be the negative, you know, the rate of change in mass in here has to be the negative of the rate of change of mass going out through the sphere. That's, that's conservation of mass. So we're going to come up with an equation for that. It's a famous equation. It's, it's standard equation of fluid dynamics. And what we're going to then do is, it's a nonlinear equation, just like our um, pressure density relationship, adiabatic relationship for an, for an ideal gas. We will linearize it, and it'll be a lot simpler, because we're interested in linear acoustics. Some of you who've had fluid dynamics have seen this before, um, but it's probably been a while, so it's good to see it again. Some of you have probably never seen this before. Okay, so to begin, <coughs> what we need is a, uh, it's a simple general relationship, sorry, of the rate at which mass is flowing through a small surface. So let's say we have a small, we're zoomed way in on the fluid here. 
because we're zoomed in, the velocity is approximately constant here. We're zoomed way in. We need to find the rate at which mass is going through this surface, this area right here. So let's allow a small amount of time to elapse. This could be changing in time. Let's allow a small amount of time to elapse. Over that time interval, which we'll call dt, delta t, the fluid that started here at the beginning of the time interval is now going to be over here. It's going to have moved a distance u times delta t. The distance is the velocity times the time. So the mass that's flowed through this surface here of area A is just the mass in this cylinder. But I know what that is. That's the density times the volume. The, right? The mass is the density times the volume. And the volume is just the volume of a cylinder, the area times this length. So we conclude that over time delta t, the mass that's flowed through the surface of area A is given by this expression. And then the, that means when we bring the de delta t over on this side of the equation, we get the rate at which mass is going through a perpendicular surface here. Surface you know, perpendicular to the flow is the density times the area times the velocity. This is almost you know, self-evident. The rate at which mass is going through, you know it's going to be proportional to the density. You know it's going to be proportional to the area for a small surface. And you know it's going to be proportional to the velocity. So you, this is a natural guess, but we just, we just derived it. OK, so now we're going to get back to this basic idea that we saw here. We're going to get back to the, apply that to this idea, to come up with a quantitative relationship that expresses conservation of mass. So let's consider, um, we've got a fluid here. Again, we're zoomed way in, OK? So <clears throat> and there's going to be some arbitrary velocity here. But because we're zoomed way in, the velocity is constant. It's approximately constant. And of course, in case I don't mention it, in the end, we're going to shrink all this down to go to 0. So our approximations will become exact. It's the usual kind of calculus idea, right? So let's look at the x component of the, of the particle velocity here. You can see that, um, oh, so this is a, we're going to take, this is a um, rectangular shape, rectangular volume here. Mm -hmm. And it's small. So this is some, has some x coordinate. This is x plus dx. Here, all we'll need here is just this, this distance. It's dy. And then there's a dz coming out here. So this is a three-dimensional you know, rec rectangular volume here. So the mass coming in due to the x, we're going to focus on the x component of the velocity here. And then we'll be easily be able to do y and z. The mass coming entering is going to be the rate at which mass is entering. We're just going to use our expression here. The rate at which mass is entering is going to be the density here, the, vent, the density at this x, times the x velocity, times the area, which is dy dz. What about the rate of fluid leaving? All right. Well, it's going to be this, the same expression, but we need to evaluate it at x plus dx, which is going to be a little different. And so these quantities can be a little different here, rho and u. So I've represented um, that like this. This is the mass, the rate at which mass is entering. This is going to be the rate at which mass is exiting due to the x velocity, which is what we're focusing on now. Now we do a Taylor expansion. And here I think I wrote it. Yeah, so here's uh, uh, the way most scientists and engineers think of a Taylor expansion. Of when they linearize, we think of this. I've got some function of some variable x. And I want to know when it deviates a small amount. As I, if, as I change my independent variable a little bit, this is going to deviate a little bit. How does it deviate? Well, it's the leading order Taylor. You know, there's a, we truncated the rest of the Taylor expansion here. Okay? So that's what we're using. That's what we used before. And we're going to use it now. This is our function f. So I know that this is going to approximately be equal to this. This is going to approximately equal the value at x. And there's going to be this correction, right, which is the derivative of the function here, our f, the product of these two, times dx. And now, what's the r net rate of mass 
entering or ex I got it. I've forgotten what, what I did here. Okay, so now, what is the net rate of mass entering the volume? Well, I've got this coming in. I've got this going out. So the net rate coming in is going to be this minus that. And do you see what happens when we take the difference? The zero order term, we call them zero order, th these are going to cancel. We just end up with this, with a minus sign. And look at this. This is really nice. Now we have a product of all the differentials. This is just the volume. So we'll call it dv. And now this is due to mass in the x direction, the flow due the x due the x flow. What about the y and z flows? It's going to be the same, right? There's no preference here. They all have the same footing, x, y, and z. So all I need to do is just for the y, the net rate of mass entering in the y direction, <coughs> I just replace x with y here. And similarly with z. So we now have the total rate of mass entering. I just add those three together. And you'll recognize this. This operation right here is the divergence of this function, of the function rho times u. Everyone should be familiar with that, right? Uh, and you may wonder, how did they, so this is a vector differential operator that you're all familiar with. How did they come up with the name divergence for this? Fluid dynamics, that's what motivated this, right? When you have this divergence, we have, it's going to be related to the fact that the if we have a positive divergence, the mass is going to be going down. So the names for these vector differential operators, curl, comes from fluid, fluid mechanics. So it's, very, it's physical. Now, so by mass conservation, the total rate of mass entering has to be the rate at which the mass is changing inside. That's what we were talked about before. The rate at which mass is changing inside is just, the mass inside is the density times the volume. The volume's constant. So the rate it changes that is just going to be this. So we set these two things equal. This must equal that by mass conservation. And we get this famous equation. equation it's called the equation of continuity. How many people have in here have seen this before? Well, yeah, but you, you just had the fluids course. I guess no one else in here. But in the past, has anybody recognized this? You've had fluid, yeah, okay. So this is, a, this is standard, one of the standard equations of fluid mechanics. You'll notice that it's nonlinear here. Um, we have these variables that we want to ultimately solve for. The density, the velocity, usually that's the case. We want to solve for them. And here's a product of those two variables. That means this is nonlinear. This can be a nightmare because of that. But are we going to care? No, we're going to linearize. So I think that's probably the next topic here. Right. So the next thing is to approximate this in the linear acoustics case and it will become much simpler. Uh, any questions about this? It's equation of continuity. So we're going to use the condensation again. Here's the definition of the condensation. And you'll note that we can solve this for the density. And, and you can probably do this in your head. You know, solve this for, invert this, solve it for the density, and you get this. Incidentally, this is a, a kind of nice expression. It's saying that the, ch the density here is the equilibrium density uh, scaled by, how, by the condensation that you have. If you have no condensation, the density is. So this is almost self-evident. This is a, it's a, a lot of times people will think of, will just immediately go to this. But if you ever have any trouble, you can always get it directly from here, from the condensation. If we substitute this expression into the equation of continuity, you can, and you can do this in your head. You know, we had the partial of rho here. I'm just substituting this into here. Here we have the divergence of rho u. So I've substituted this, multiplied it out. Here's what we get. Now, what's, uh, what's the derivative of a constant? Zero, right? The derivative goes right through this constant. 
the, the row knots here come outside because they're constant. So we can cancel a row knot here, and we get this, okay? Now, we haven't really done anything yet. We've, we've just, we're just doing some mathematical manipulations. This is still exact. We have not made any approximations. Now comes the approximation. Linear acoustics means the sound is just a perturbation. It means that the condensation is much less than one. For acoustic waves, for linear acoustics, and just about all of acoustics, incidentally, uh, even nonlinear acoustics, it's still almost always true, that this only deviates a very small amount from this. In fact, I've forgotten, and I didn't, I didn't look this up, but the sound from my voice right now, what do you think the condensation is for the compressions in the What do you think it is? I, I, I don't know, but a, a rough guess, I would guess, is like one part in a million, okay? I think it's really tiny, really tiny. Now, and what's that, what is that telling you? Our ears are incredible, are amazing transducers, you know, through evolution, through millions of years, right? Well, I guess not, yeah, I guess millions. Or, it, yeah, our, our ears are, are very impressive transducers. So this is typically, almost always, ex extremely small. What about the particle velocity? Well, again, this is the particle velocity of the sound wave. Again, for acoustics, it's gonna be small. Acoustics is just, linear acoustics is just a slight perturbation of this uniform state. What we're thinking in here is a uniform state. So when I've got two small quantities, now what do we mean by u is small? Here this is a definite mathematical statement. This is actually meaningless as it stands. Why is that? Small, small compared to what? We don't know. So this is actually, we don't have any meaning for this, but we will uh, uh, come up with a meaning for it. And I think we're going to do it in a problem. That's going to be a homework problem, okay? I'll tell you the answer right now. If the particle velocity is small compared to the speed of sound, then we're in the linear acoustics regime. Well, that's one of the requirements. There's other requirements you have to have, too. But a, a linear acoustics wave will have a particle velocity that's small compared to the speed of sound. We haven't really talked about the speed of sound yet, so we just, but we'll get there. So, again, I have, this is a small quantity, this is a small quantity. What do I do with it for linear acoustics? It's gone. We eliminate it just like we did before, same idea in, as, as in the uh, thermodynamics. So we end up with this nice linear equation. This is the linearized equation of continuity. This is what we want for acoustics. That's what we're going to use. lecturing too fast, well, I'll get used to it. <laughs> um, anybody have any questions about that? And again, you can see this is a linear differential equation. The variables that we want to solve for here only appear, they either don't appear or to the first power in each term. That's, that's what a linear equation is. And linear, all linear equations can be solved. But nonlinear equations usually require some effort. And sometimes they have no solutions. For example, since I, we have time here, I must, uh, a pendulum, a driven pendulum. Let's say I'm, I'm driving it here. Finite amplitude, it can even go over the top. No solution exists. And one of the reasons you know that is this system can be chaotic. And there's no, you can't write down, no one can write down functions of chaotic motion, which you should expect because chaotic is, chaos is very erratic of motion, right? There are no functions that directly describe that. There are statistical approaches and ways of understanding the motion, but no analytical functions that describe chaotic motion. So that's one of the very exciting things that happened when people started to pay more attention to nonlinear systems. Is the, all these fundamental discoveries were made. Chaos was one of them. This is all fairly recent, you know, this is like in the six, 1970s. So that's the subject of, that, of this, uh, this course. <laughs> Nonlinear oscillations and waves, which is offered every spring here. Now, now I need to tell you something. If 
you look in the book, it's going to look more complicated than what I just presented here, okay? And the reason is they, to prepare students for underwater acoustics, um, we've considered the system, when there's no sound, to be a uniform system. The pressure is constant everywhere and the density is the same everywhere. It's a uniform system. You can go through this analysis assuming that you have slow variations in the pressure and the density, which is relevant for sound in the ocean, right? So KFC has to do that. They carry it along. And when I started teaching this course years ago, I think I did it once or twice, and it's just too complicated. For the first time through acoustics, you don't want to, you don't want to see that. It's, it makes it too complicated. But these equations will survive approximately, even if you have a slow variation of, um, of the, sometimes we call it the background, of the, of the state, of, of your medium, a slow variation of the equilibrium pressure, P, what we're calling P naught, and the equilibrium density. These equations, it turns out, that we're working on here will survive. If you're interested in that, you can look in the book. And I guess you'll, you'll hit this in the next acoustics course in 3452. I've never taught that, I don't know, so I don't, I don't and I don't want to teach it, but, <laughs> but uh, that's where it will become relevant. For this course, we're just taking a uniform, what's relevant for us here in the, in the lab is a uniform system. When there's no sound, we have a constant pressure everywhere, constant density. Okay, we got one more relationship, one more equation here. We've got thermodynamics that relates the pressure and density in a, in a sound wave. We've got the fact that mass is conserved. Now we need dynamics. We need some kind of, we need F equals ma. And F is equal to ma for a fluid is called Euler's equation. And that's what we're going to start to derive right now. All right. So we're going to do this as simply as possible. We're going to neglect viscosity. You know, there are, in general in a fluid, there are viscous forces. We're going to neglect those forces. There can be gravitational forces. We're going to neglect those. We're just going to do the simplest case. And that's what leads to Euler's equation. So another way of looking at it is we're going to um, neglect the fact that energy can be dissipated into heat. That's what arises when you have viscosity and you have thermal conduction. We're going to neglect thermal conduction. It's purely adiabatic. Um, now this sounds like may sound like oh this is totally unrealistic as I've presented it to you here, <laughs> but it's not. It works in a, a lot of cases. You know there are a lot of fluid dynamics. There's situations in fluid dynamics where these are good approximations. So if you can make the approximations you want, because otherwise it, it's going to get real complicated. It's complicated anyway. Fluid dynamics is complicated anyway. Later on in the course, we'll, we'll include um, thermoviscous effects. There's a, really a whole chapter on that. And the effect of that, of course, is that a sound wave will attenuate. Its amplitude will go down. So we'll actually calculate that from, from a fundamental point of view. All right, so how do we do F is equal to MA? Well, what we mean by F is equal to MA here is that we're gonna, we need to deal with a fluid particle. The total force on that fluid particle has to be its mass times its acceleration. That's Newton's second law. So that's what we need to, we need to come up with an equation, a fluid equation for that. So we consider a fluid particle. We're again going to consider a rectangular particle for convenience. Incidentally, um, I don't know if you worry about this, but sometimes people worry about the fact is some people have worried about this, okay? I remember reading about it a long time ago. We ch we ch we're going to choose a rectangular fluid particle. Again, this is going to be small. You can see the smallness here. Does, is that going to influence our, our final equation? We hope not, right? We hope to get the same answer for a sphere or any shape. But how do we know that? Well, one interesting um, clue, the fact that it, the answer is it doesn't matter when you shrink it down to zero. And one way to appreciate that, there are several ways. 
but one way is right here. You'll notice when we go from here to here, what happened to our rectangle? It's essentially, it's essentially gone here. All that's important is the volume. The math is telling us that it doesn't matter what the shape is. It's telling us that. And there are other arguments you can make. OK, so again, z is out here. Okay? So there's, a, a, a d, there's an area here, here that has the value dy, this length, times whatever the, the dz length of our you know, cube or rectangle, rectangular fluid particle is. There's going to be a force. The pressure, this is the pressure in the fluid at this point. The force will be the pressure times the area. And similarly, over here, going the opposite direction, due to the pressure in the fluid here, it's going to exert a force on this particle. It's going to be this pressure times that area, the same area as before. But the pressures can be different. And that's, of course, significant, because if the pressures are different, what's going to happen here? We're just looking in the x direction. There's going to, if there's an imbalance in pressure, there's going to be an acceleration. So we're headed towards Newton's second law here. So you can see what's coming here, right? Here's the net. We're going to look in the x direction first, just like we did before. And now, um, what is the net force in the x direction? Well, I see a force here, which is the pressure times the area. I see a force in the opposite direction, which is this pressure, which can, which can be a little different, times that area. And now, what is this when we shrink dx down? Oh, incidentally, we're not making a linear acoustics assumption here. We're just making the, we think of this as a delta x, and then as we take the limit as delta x goes to zero, all that survives is going to be the first order of Taylor thing here. So this is exact in the limit as uh, this dx goes to zero. This dx really means, well, anyway, I properly should think of this as a delta x and delta x going to zero. So we've seen this now, this is the third time maybe? Or, or, yeah, third time I guess we've seen this. You Taylor expand this, all that's going to survive is the, when we take the limit is the, uh, the leading order term and we get this derivative here. And again, here's the volume em naturally emerging. All that's important is the volume of the fluid particle. So the net force in the x direction is minus the derivative of the pressure times the volume. Why is it a minus? Well, you can see here, suppose we have a pressure that's increasing with x. Which way is the force going to point? As I've, I've drawn this arrow a little bigger, right? Which way will the force point? to the negative direction. So that minus sign is correct. We need that minus sign there. Now, do we have to redo the calculation in the y direction and the z direction? No. Right? All we do is, here's the net force in the x direction. What's going to be the net force in the y direction? You just replace the x with a y. And similarly in the z direction. So the total force, force is a vector quantity. So this is the force in the x direction. So for the total force, I want to add an x unit vector here. I'm going to have essentially the same in the y and z direction. I just changed the coordinates. And again, this we, ha we call this something. OK? And you, you all should know what it is. It's the, this operation. On the, it's the gradient. It's minus the gradient. So we've concluded here that the total net force, neglecting vis viscosity, gravity, thermal conduction, simplest case of fluid dynamics, the total force is minus, on a fluid particle is minus the gradient of the pressure times the volume. As the volume shrinks to zero, the force shrinks to zero. What's important is how it shrinks. What is the magnitude of it? What is the value? How, what's the rate at which the force is decreasing to zero? So most people think of this. The relevant quantity here is the net force on the particle per unit volume divided by the volume of the particle. And that's simply minus the gradient of the pressure. OK, so we've got the force, all right? We now have this. What's the mass of the particle? No problem, right? Oops. 
I mean, we called it dV or delta V. I don't care. The mass is no problem. What's the acceleration? Well, you might think that it's this. The rate of change of the velocity, right? Very natural thing to think. It turns out not to be true, exactly. Steve knows this. Maybe, what's your name? Your, what's your Sean. first name? Sean. Sean, okay. I'm learning names. I'm, I'm starting. I will learn your names. <laughs> uh, even the distance learning students' names. I'll learn them. It turns out it's not true. And um, it emerges Actually, it emerges because we're using Eulerian coordinates. Remember, fluid dynamics, the standard fluid dynamics approach is to use these laboratory coordinates <coughs> rather than coordinates attached to the particle, where each particle has a fixed set of coordinates. Um, so there's a price to pay for that. And that's, we'll, we'll, it, um, we'll talk about this tomorrow, first thing. But I want to tell you that it turns out that it doesn't matter. For linear acoustics, this will, be, this will be true, just what you'd expect. It'll turn out to be true. But it is not true in general, and it's, it's important in fluid dynamics. It's a source of nonlinearity, which means in fluid dynamics, it's a source of turbulence. So it's a big deal in fluid dynamics. But it turns out it's not going to matter for us, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. OK, does anybody have any um, questions about anything? Um, okay, that's it.